Hi and welcome. Um, Brendan Henderson here from Deakin Unity. Deakin Uni. Um, I reside in the Faculty of Health as the HSE manager. Um, and I'd also like to thank the ALSA exec for endorsing this, along with um, some great back end work done by Mikhail, Raylene, Andrew, and Vanessa to help piece this together. Um, when we, I put the question out about doing this, the exec support was really strong. Um, unfortunately, at RN Deacon did, didn't quite come through with the capability from a technology end to make this happen compared to what I first checked four or five months ago. But we got it up and running thanks to the, with, of Raylene's end at JCU, so that's much appreciated. As I said, I, I've given my overview here. I'll just get, quickly say this is the first one that's been run, so do bear with us a little bit. Um, Hopefully the nerves don't show through from any of us today while we're going through it, but it is very much a test case around what we're wanting, I guess, you know, around a concept and seeing if it's got some validity and running forward again other, around other topics people might want to discuss. So um, I'll hand over to Raylene and Vanessa to introduce themselves as well, and then we'll quickly come back just around a few um, little outlines of the session and what we'd like to see happen. So over to you, Raylene. Hi, my name's Raylene Fuquandi. I'm the HSC Training and Communications Advisor for James Cook University. So part of my role here uh, assists with the, the training and communications in regards to workplace health and safety. So being a uh, stakeholder in regards to um, working with our divisions that we have currently at the moment to uh, put together a placement uh, procedure. So we're at the stage of where we've got it drafted out for consultation and looking to get some feedback today to how other universities are managing placements and how they're moving forward in regards to safety in regards to placements. Um, I'm Vanessa Hearn. I'm the Safety and Research and Teaching Coordinator at Murdoch University here in WA. Um, I look at we look at four specific hazards at Murdoch, what our office does, the fieldwork, biosafety, radiation, and chemicals. Um, with regard to fieldwork, we've got a large vet school, and so we've got students going out and doing placements you know, everywhere. And one of the things that I'm meant to be looking at is um, how can we ensure that these students are going out and doing it safely and, and maintaining contact with um, staff here at Murdoch while they're out doing their placements. So yeah, hopefully we can get something out of this webinar today. Beautiful, thank you. And quickly from our end around um, Deakin, we run clinical and non-clinical placements. I've been in this role about two years um, and our clinical and non-clinical placement teams sit quite separately from one another um, with what's known as the Work Integrated Learning Unit. And there's various ways that they do their checks and balances before a placement commences. Some of it's through agreement, some of it's, um, all of them are through agreement, but some of them have a little bit more rigidity than others. And then other placements will see, um, see pre-placement modules, others just go in and self-source. So it's trying to work out from our end um, what we should be doing, I guess, from a consistency perspective and, and benchmarking ourselves against what else is out there. Um, just before we start with, I guess, the overviews of each of the, the case studies we've got this morning, uh, today, along with some questions which we want your um, engagement from, we're keen, if you have got a resource, please um, share this into the chat box. You can upload files. Our, our testing proved this the other week, which was good. Um, we'll aim to send these out and have, they'll either come out via an email or we'll sit them on a OneDrive or something similar, um, depending on the number of um, items we get across this. Um, can we ask that your microphones are muted um, other than when you are, have put your hand up to chat? I think, Raylene, you, you're seeing more than I can, so if I'm missing something there, you can probably outline the process around that one. I apologise, I can't detail that. Um, and please use the chat box for questions in the first instance, and then we'll go on a bit of a hierarchical order around um, getting you to have some input or ask those questions. I think it's fair to say... Um, None, none of us will have all the answers here. It's very much a conversation from my end. I'm hoping we can hear what others are doing as well and get some insights and start to share the knowledge bank. So moving into, um, I guess, the, the three case studies, we'll work through these each quickly just to give some context and then we'll move into three themed areas for some discussion um, where we need your input. So relative to Deakin University, 
where I, I reside primarily within the Faculty of Health, we've got placements within the School of Medicine, which sees students hosted across an array of environments, predominantly in the rural areas. Um, so those country towns um, where the, there is hospitals, but also clinics in these rural areas. And we also have a number of placements over, taken, undertaken overseas where it's, um, students can pick where they want to go, but they do have to get an approval from the associate dean, in our instance, international, so that they've got some capturing. And there's another layer of registration there um, through our international team. I'll move down into the next for Vanessa's Murdoch context. Okay, so we've got um, our vet students. We have about 300 students a year going out doing their placements. Um, so this is required as part of their course for first, third and fifth year. Um, they go out to local interstate international farms and I think because it's rural and remote, we don't necessarily get the chance to vet these farms. And we're, you know, sometimes they're larger farms, sometimes they're mum and dad owned um, entities. And where, you know, our concern is how do we handle these placements? Do we get every student to complete a fieldwork safety form for every farm visit that they do? Um, we've tried, we've, you know, figured that's a fair bit because it's 300 students, three placements. So instead we try to do a bit of a workshop, all the risks related to um, being out on the farm and you know, complete a single um, fieldwork safety form highlighting these are the risks, um, these are the controls that we're putting in place. Um, but also, you know, it, it's a matter of once the students are on the farm, what kind of connection do they have back to the university? Because they're out there for two weeks um, at any given time um, because it's quite remote and then they don't necessarily have contact with their supervisors, you know, every day. We're trying to put together a contact plan um, if things go wrong, this is what you need to do. Um, but also, how do we check, how do we vet these farms? Um, we, you know, as from a safety point of view, from our office, we can't go out to every farm. So what exactly are we meant to be doing? How do we ensure that these farms, for instance, you know, have proper emergency procedures in place, There's a, um, that the students are getting the right inductions? What exactly, how do we ensure that this is, being done, and this is where I'm coming from, um, and you know it's, it's going to move across to our clinical uh, nursing placements and our chiro placements. So if we can kind of bed down a process for the vet placements, that would be fantastic because then we can just adopt that procedure moving forward for our other placements. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, Vanessa, and I'll then go to Raylene for CQU's um, case study context. So for James Cook University, um, we have uh, very similar examples to what Brendan and, and Vanessa have in regards to the different types of placements and different types of hosts that we have from our clinical backgrounds through to our vet um, and this example here of being our College of Science and Engineering students uh, who can be hosted in various mining type and engineering businesses, which some can be very large and some can be very small. So we have a, um, over... Up to 500 placements are uh, you looking at possibly around the same amount if not more hosts that we do engage to be able to place these students we have them um, going out right from third year second third and beyond as part of their placement requirements also but from our end we have um, started some engagement and started some processes around thinking about risk management and very similar to Murdoch in the place where you can't necessarily go out and risk assess every single host um, especially in those remote areas, um, international and uh, state areas as well. So looking for information and feedback around those. All right, beautiful. So with those three pieces of information in mind, we can now move into, I guess, some questioning around this, and this is where we need some input from other areas. Um, we'll try and give a little bit of oversight from our respective um, organisations around what we do have, but... We're really hoping the floor can open up a little bit and provide some insight around what they've done, what's worked well, what's something that may have even failed um, and how you've re refined it to now get it in a good working you know, order. So the first topical area based on the, what we've discussed is the OHS risk management piece here. And you see the scope of the work environments can be from large 
corporations with certified um, SMSs to small private firms which have limited safety documentation. So I guess from um, the questions we've posed are what should be the minimum expectation? Um, do we need to apply context relative to the size of the organisation? Also, as always, we should be trying to consider best practice, but what does that look like? And any practical examples of what has or hasn't worked? Um, I'm open to the floor on this one, or if one of the other two um, co-facilitating wants to start, I'm all ears. Yeah, so I'm happy, to. <laughs> I'm happy to from James Cook University. So in regards uh, in, in looking at um, tackling this as part of what we've created with uh, getting the draft procedure in place, uh, in regards to risk management approach, um, rather than trying to have the same approach for every single host that we have, which is very hard to embed those, those safety um, compliance requirements, looking at identifying where our high risk um, hosts are and then ensuring that we're dealing and ensuring the safety requirements are in place there and then moving on to our medium and then our low risk. So we've created and we're using a risk management approach around um, some six safety factors that help us in determining whether the host is sitting at a high, low, a high, medium or low. So thinking in regards to our work factors, so what the actual work that the student will be carrying out and the nature of where those workplace hazards um, and what they may be exposed to. Taking into consideration travel and transportation factors as well. So the place host spent um, identifying the risk factor depending on the nature and the location of the placement. So that helps us identify whether it's remote, um, international type requirements. Uh, is there a need for accommodation and the students to be having to stay out as opposed to being able to travel each day? Uh, the location and the region factors have a considerable impact as well. So if they're overboard, uh, out of country, those sorts of scenarios. And then the general environmental health factors in and welfare issues around the environmental conditions in which they're going to be placed in as well. Um, not only just accommodation, but food, drink, um, those sorts of facilities that they are, are available to have in place. The individual student factor can come into play as well with helping us with our profiling. So the knowledge um, that the individuals have in regards to what hazards they might be exposed to um, with the type of activities that they're doing out in that area. So in the background, we've been working um, with the divisions here to put into place some requirements around how we provide that information to students before they go out onto placements. And as a bigger picture, looking at implementing an undergraduate risk management training course that is part of the study for um, people who are, are studying here at the university to undertake as well. So those sorts of risk factors help us to um, identify using a risk profiling tool uh, if it's a high, medium or low host and then from that, having other um, placements uh, requirements into place with approvals, uh, checklists that might need to be completed to identify uh, what sort of safety uh, requirements are being conducted at the host. And do we need to provide any extra information to that as well? So we've started using that with one of our divisions here or two of our divisions here as a trial process where we've identified our high risk Post, and then looking at ensuring that the approval agreement um, safety checklist process is in place following that. Okay. I think that's pretty comprehensive. Thank you. Um, yeah, so at, at, at Murdoch, we're because um, you know, generally farm placements and the activities involved tend to be quite high risk anyway. Um, and I guess it just depends on where the farm is situated, you know, whether we're looking at something within Australia or overseas and, and where overseas as well. Um, it, and, and like I said, it's really hard to vet these um, farms. Um, we're not going there all the time. And sometimes the students get there, when the students do arrive at their destination, it is for the first time. So it's not like they get to going to the farm, having a chat to the farm, and then coming back and, and making decisions to whether or not they want to continue their placement there. Um, so 
generally the students have this little red book that they take to the, on their farm placements and the farmers have to sign off on what they've done and if they've um, basically signing off on their hours. Um, and what we were trying to do is within this red book embed a bit of um, an induction checklist, you know, to say and have the farmer sign off on it saying, yes, we've provided them with induction training. Um, we've taken them through all you know, our health and safety rules. Um, we've trained them in terms of how to use specialized equipment, given them the appropriate PPE, um, show them you know, if we've got relevant firefighting equipment, fire extinguishers, hose reels, so on and so forth. Um, if it's a large organization, you know, this is sort of the, um, we've got you know, health and safety reps or the self framework. Um, and also how to report incidents, injuries and hazards, because this is one of the things that we want actually fed back to the university. Because if it is, a f so firstly, we want the farmers to be signing off on this. So when the students come back, we know, yes, they've been provided or even um, basically sending us a photo going, yep, this has been signed off right at the start, because we don't want any of this to be signed off retrospectively. Obviously, it defeats the purpose if the last, on the last day of the farmers signing off, um, we need to be done right at the start to ensure that they are providing our students with the um, you know, adequate amenities and, and training. Um, but also we want the students to feed back to us about the experiences on these farms, because that's going to help us rate these farms in terms of whether we want to send future, future students to them, because trying to build up a bit of a list, um, a repository on, I guess, sort of like what Raylene's doing, you know, rating high, medium, low risks. We want to rate our farms based on the sort of safety around those farms. And the only way we can do it is if we get our students to feed back. And you know, sometimes, and this, is a, this has been a huge concern for us, because sometimes students go through um, sort of traumatic events on these farms, but they don't know how to report back to the university. And even if it is reported back, it doesn't reach the right level. It stays within that unit. And we want it to be escalated so that we can ensure that if it's a farm that we don't want our future students to be going to, we've got that sort of black marked, um, blacklisted. Um, if it's you know a fantastic farm and students are really getting value out of it, we want to be able to send more of our students there. So this is just something that we're trialing in terms of having this induction this checklist put into the red book because of the students, you know, hours have to be signed off. And if we embed the safety aspect of it within the, this book. We're hoping that it can be signed off. It's sort of our first pass, and we're trialing it with a few of our placement units, and we're hoping that you know we get some traction, and we'll see how we we go um, moving forward. Yeah. Has anyone else out there raised their hand and want to provide some input around what um, their organisation is doing? Can you see if anyone has Raylene? <laughs> no, no one's no one's posed a question. Okay. But um, to carry on from Vanessa's. We we're, we're very similar around um, looking at induction processes uh, and having a, a a checklist that goes out, uh, especially in that farming environment, that it's actually customised to the industry in which uh, we are sending the students to. So it does highlight some of the, uh, the risk or the hazards that the students may be exposed to and then asking them do they have those um, processes, systems in place to ensure, um, you know, they are being inducted or trained or supervised or shown how to use those sorts of equipment out in those areas as well. So that's um, part of that whole pre-stuff that goes out with agreement type information that we're trialling with um, some of our hosts as well at the moment. Okay. We're a little bit behind, I'd say, in that piece. So I think our clinical arrangements are a lot stronger um, around agreements because the students actually, they probably in a nearby town, um, they're still probably, I think one of the bigger risks is the, is the driving piece if they're working in the clinical sites because they've got a bit of travel between areas and depending on length of day, which they've curved back um, as part of the placement. But we're, we're probably a bit better where we would face issue would be more in that social work space. Um, and what's growing for us is the off-site visits, in, even within the medicine piece where they go into an unknown premises or they're going to a patient's house that might be after birth or it could be a vulnerable, um, I guess, 
the social work setting in particular is more vulnerable. So um, looking to apply going in pairs. I think the medicine space could be a little bit loose around that one. Um, but the social work side's a lot tighter, especially due to the vulnerability. But that's probably an area that we're um, going to have to look into a little bit more as time progresses as well around how we have that going. And part of our work at the moment is profiling each of our um, each of the, the schools or each of the hospital sites within the schools to see what is in place and what sort of checks and balances are applied. And we're, we're more or less still coming, going through that delve um, at the moment. So I can't value add much more um, beyond what you two have, which sounds like a much more robust framework. Um, and but as much as it's been trialled, it looks like it's got some good legs on it to um, see a nice little framework come to, into play. The, well, the other thing that we're, um, you know, I, I'm, I'd love some feedback on is um, communications plan. So for now, we ask our students and well, and students undertaking any field work to their communication plan needs to be with their direct supervisor or unit coordinator. Um, now, in terms of you know these placements, if we have three hundred students, you know one or two unit coordinators. That means the unit coordinator is going to, you know, check in would be per student, you know, every night or several students or quite a few students checking in with the unit coordinator. And we're trying to figure, I mean, what's the best approach to doing this? We, the other thing we've done is because we don't necessarily want to use family as a um, check-in. You know, yes, they're listed as emergency contact, but not necessarily regular check-in because we've got a procedure in place that, if the student, so the fieldwork you know, leader or fieldwork participant fails to make check-in, the person that they're meant to be checking in with activates um, our emergency procedure and, um, and vice versa, if something happens while you're out in the field, depending on you know, how far away from the university you are, we've got an emergency procedure that's activated and you know, it's, it's accepted by the university that this is what we're going to do. But I think in terms of having you know, 300 students, two or three unit coordinators. I don't really know how, what's the best way to handle a communication plan. Um, do we try, need to get people outside of that, the scope of the unit? We do want to keep it within the university, so obviously Murdoch's staff. But what would be the best approach with regard to a comms plan? So if anyone has ideas or suggestions, that would be fantastic. We, we at James Cook University have student placement officers in place who uh, do handle a lot of um, the placement processes and the, with the students uh, a lot as well in regards to um, communication and making sure they've arrived and if there's any issues or any concerns as well. One of the other things is through that uh, review process uh, that they have to write like a reflection as part of how was their placement. So we have background information on things that occurred or didn't necessarily occur that, again, can help us work mm -hmm. um, improving that, uh, that with the host or maybe not necessarily sending them there again as well. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, we have, we have the similar, you know, provide feedback on your experience. And we do have placement coordinators. Um, however... You know, how, how does it work in terms of after hours contact? Because these coordinators, you know, they're, they're admin, um, in, they're in an admin role. And do we really expect them after four or after five to still be in touch with students? How exactly would that work? We're, we're looking at a couple of options. Uh, there, there are emergency type contacts in place that if uh, there are any uh, concerns whilst on placement, that can be the university number. Um, to call them, get into contact with someone 24 7. We're also looking at um, seeing a Are You OK app as well that students mm -hmm. download, and what it allows them to be able to do is they can ask um, security to follow them if they're leaving from the car park to their car. And also, use it as a, as they call it, like a ping where it just pings to say, I'm OK, and like a checking in type process as well. Okay. Yeah, so that's um, uh, something 
that's coming into place in a couple of weeks. But not just for placements for university students um, and staff. Assistant security and, and making sure that people are okay. Yeah, we looked into the geofencing piece within the safe zone app as well. We didn't go any further and we've got an internal app here that's more around being on campus, but we did we have asked the question about support for students um, that might be on placement that could do a bit more than just being a bit of a, um, I guess, like a, a, a genie assistant that helps you um, more like your Amazon or your, your Google um, Home piece that has sort of more your bare um, bones in it that it could be a bit more value add, but we haven't been able to advance those conversations, unfortunately, here. I know relative to um, banking is quite an interesting area where they do a lot more work with their staff around the design of their workspaces, but also how they monitor their staff and have a comms plan in place around what, you know, minimum standards are um, and what they should be doing to ensure their safety. So there might be some learnings from um, from other industries as well, which I think, you know, that's probably something we could explore down the track. Okay. That sounds good. The other one we've had is that the, a couple of units in particular have got pre-unit sites around what they need to do before they start their unit or they have a communique, as they call it, that has resources that helps them. And the other piece we, um, we're looking at is um, in place, which I think most tertiary institutions have... Um, implemented is seeing what features we could use through in place around checking or blacklisting and flags if there was a um, organisation that you know became no longer a, a fit. We've had instances here with um, poor supervisor interactions or inappropriate super interactions, and we've blacklisted that organisation or that supervisor in particular um, for placements based on student feedback. And we we now have got I think. Um, for the best part, dual reporting in place. We've strongly communicated that over the last 12 months in particular, and we've seen a lot higher uplift in our incident reports around placements through that, which has been good as much as we don't want to see them, but it's helping us gather information around what is happening out um, outside of our sort of, you know, the university campus itself when students are on placement. And, you know, I, I agree in terms of the reporting because what we found is what one student may be, you know, a student may be okay with it, another student may not be. And so we're trying to get them to report as in, and it has been in the last six to 12 months, pushing the reporting. Um, Cause they may come back and speak to the unit coordinator, but it doesn't filter, it doesn't come up at a higher level. And we are trying to encourage students to report any incidents that occur. And, you know, especially it goes down the path of sexual harassment. If what you may deem as sexual harassment, somebody else may not, but we still want this to be reported because more often than not, um, a lot of our vet students tend to be international students and we just, you know, it's, it's a reputation for the university, but more especially it's the safety of these students. And if we know that students are experiencing, you know, certain unsavory behaviour from um, farmers or farmhands, we want to be aware of it so that we can actually blacklist these farms as a precaution, but you know, precautionary measure. We want to know, yep, this is what's happening, and, and take them off our list. Um, and, and even though you know the, the argument is it's really hard for to find farms, but I think I'd rather err on the side of caution and, and ensure that we don't send our students to these places and find the farms that are safe. And, you know, farmers who are actually take their safety into consideration and are going to treat them with respect. So that's one of the things we're pushing here as well. Beautiful. Has anyone got any questions on this one before we move to the next discussion point? I'll let Raylene give me a yay or an A. Yeah, not, not from the chat. Okay, beautiful. All right, we'll move on to the next point, um, discussion item. So, which leads in nicely from what Vanessa was just talking about in the international and higher risk placement. So um, the checks and balances you do to aid comfort in being able to proceed if you see a placement to be higher risk. Um, and I think, Vanessa, you can probably take over here from the vet science context. And I think you've already alluded to some of this, but I'll let you um, start off anyway. Okay. So, um, you know, one of the things that we did try to do is um, 
we, I think that the biggest thing was doing a risk workshop with these unit coordinators, identifying the highest, you know, all the potential risks, um, and um, basically trying to get the students, because it's one thing for us to do risk assessments, and it's another for the students to actually be aware of what's being done. So we're trying to put it back on the students to go, you know, this is what we've done. Um, these are risk assessments that have been um, conducted and you need to be aware of the controls that we've put in place. Um, but also to, so that the farmer, well, firstly, it's, it's mainly about educating the students so that they know this is their, these are their rights and responsibilities. These are their rights for when they're on the farm. Um, and when they do go on the farm, they're not, um, they don't feel intimidated by the farmers because they go, well, actually, this is, I've been informed that this is what you need to be doing to, um, to ensure my safety. Um, we also have a, um, we have a farm here on campus and it's, we sort of have it as, um, you know, this is a standard for what to expect on a farm because bear in mind, you know, quite a few students, depending on where they come from, where in the world they come from, they may not have been on a farm. Um, so having the sort of initial exposure here at uh, Murdoch is fantastic for them. But also, you know, we, we do additional training for these um, students. So the unit coordinates will run um, just farm, farm handling, farm safety courses prior to them even going onto the farm. So they, once they're there, they know what to expect. And if they are not being provided with that level of quality, of, um, then they are actually given the option of contacting their unit coordinators and saying, you know, this is what's happening so that we can, um, for future reference, either pull them out immediately and then for future reference rate these farms based on what they are and aren't providing this, um, our students with. Um, but yeah, it's really hard to, like I said, to pre-screen these farms. We can only go based on experience, based on what the first student experiences and, and what they feed back to us. If it's something that's more local, yes, we can pre-screen, but other than that, it is based on the feedback that we get from our students. And in that way, we can start rating our farms and, um, you know, what they are and aren't providing our students with. So the questions are, and I, it'd be great to hear from the floor here, what do you deem is reasonably practicable around this? And what can be done to aid the farmers without just being a tick and a flick? So. Um, I'd love to hear from someone listening in around a, a similar situation. It doesn't have to be a vet science context. It can be another, um, you know, placement scenario around what you do. Um, I said these th the part of today is to try and pick up some tips and tricks and some little gems. So we'll open this one up to the floor to see if someone can um, provide some insight from another education provider. I don't know if we don't take no for an answer here, Raylene. Okay, so Libby has asked, what happens if a student reports a farm as being unsafe? We, unit coordinator will, will basically look into this farm because we do have the placement coordinator doing on paper a sort of um, a vetting so it's not actually going in there in person, but it's just, it's more on paper. But like I said, we do rely on them, on the students coming back and saying, this is the case. It's investigated and um, then rated, basically. And, and if we, it comes back, you know, with a pretty high rating of, we don't want to send future students there. It's, um, we've got a database, well, an Excel sheet, a database of all these farms, and we would basically strike it off our list so that we're not, you know, for future reference, we're not going to be sending students to these farms. But also if, if the students at that point, while they're on the farm and they feel unsafe, we are trying to educate them that they need to feed back this information as quickly as possible to the unit coordinators so that we can pull them out of those farms as quickly as possible. Beautiful. Anything from your end, Raylene? Yeah, so just um, Libby's also added to that in, um, you know, guarantee that students will not be sent to the farm in the future. So 
I guess um, that that record and that communication process that if that has come into play uh, where you are not wanting to take placements to that particular area, that that is you know, communicated and it's kept within the system to, to know that sort of stuff. Um, when we uh, looked at a first this when we spoke to our vet area, uh, it's very difficult in the fact that we posts are not easy to come by. So um, making sure that we do do a, a good assessment with them and have those um, customised checklists and questions in place to help them to be able to provide us with what safety do they have in place. There is no safety in place um, working with them uh, to assist in improving their safety management as well. So, again, based on what's happening with that particular student to that particular farm, what hazards and risks are they going to be exposed to and do we have those minimum requirements in place around induction, safe work procedures with um, equipment that they may be using um, and minimising their exposure to any hazards and risks, but they might not have a full-blown procedure around it, but the information is verbally being provided to the student through inductions and then followed up um, through JCU and the host to ensure that the safeness of the area. I mean, you know, I, I agree with Raylene. That's something that we are um, moving towards, um, trying to work with the farmers, because you're right, placements are quite hard to come by, and we... We can't strike off every farm based on every complaint that we get. And we do need to try and work with the farmers to see if we can help them. Because, you know, yes, we help them now, but it's going to assist them moving forward with their own processes as well. And for future students, you know, not necessarily from our university, but from other universities as well. So whatever we do now obviously has you know, a, a future impact. Um, so we also want to, you know, go down the same path as Raylene and, and try to work with these farmers. And, and this has been something that's, because we've got new unit coordinators taking over these placement um, units, they're very keen to try and work with us and uh, bring safety into the fold in terms of how we deal with those farms that are not 100% compliant with our requirements. So it is basically trying to work closely with the farmers to see what we can do. And, and also, you know, it, and, and like Raylene said, it, it's individual incidents, individual students, what went wrong and, and doing a proper investigation to figure out what went wrong um, and how can we um, move past it and, and put some corrective processes in place. Okay, is there anything else from the chat box? So Libby's, um, Libby's just expanded on, on some of her comments uh, there in the chat box, which everyone can see. Um, if they don't need to have a process to collect and act on the information, if you have a process that says you will blacklist a farm, and you don't comply with it, that could be a legal issue. And there should be someone else to talk to um, about that. So I guess that's a bit of a path that we've gone through with, with these checklists that we have created for the host is from legal advice to ensure that we are asking the right questions to ensure we get the right information from that and then doing an assessment based on what comes back with that as well and seeking uh, legal advice Yep, so probably moving on to the next slide, Brendan. Okay, beautiful. So this is our last discussion point. Um, support services for students on a placement. So how are students supported across their placements from the OHS perspective? And also, um, we, we all know the wellbeing and welfare side is um, a pretty red hot topic at the moment. Um, so keen to hear around if there's any other additional mechanisms in place, um, and particularly if the placement's regional or remote or international. From a Deakin perspective, I can probably give a little bit of insight that um, the, each of the uh, areas, as we said, they're quite good, but there is some triage in place through the clinical placement offices, um, also the unit chairs within the unit sites. So a piece we're working on at the moment is um, having a lot of conversation as part of our sort of hazard analysis pieces with the 
um, relevant unit chairs in particular with placements around embedding um, relevant support resources into at least their unit sites so that they have a little repository um, that's easily accessible to them rather than sort of having to sift the minefield of a, a, a university website, um, which we are probably just, we have just started conversation with our student body, um, not the association, but our student support body here um, around the comms program that they put out to students and we've heard they can tailor quite nichely to students. So that's something we're looking at around um, students relevant to certain units that they can do targeted comms and how that looks. Um, we've stripped back some of the resources to being one or two pages, you know, more than what you need to know than what um, than the whole context. So we're trying to be pretty short and sharp with what we do have. Um, from a School of Medicine perspective, they're quite lucky they've actually got a counsellor dedicated um, part-time on site that students can access at any point in time if they are experiencing issues. As we know, medicine, it's a pretty highly strung um, environment. And when you're studying through that, you're, you're expected to learn a lot. So they've got a bit of an internal triage process in place. Other schools don't run that way, though. It's very much through the unit chair, you know, recommendations that they undertake mental health um, first aid training so they can start to pick up on when students may be a little bit um, stressed or under the the pump, I guess, for another word. Um, some of our staff do do some visits. I think that's becoming less now, though, um, and it's more around the support resources that we can embed in a cloud perspective um, based on time and, I guess, unfortunately, money in some regards too. International environments, we, we work through international SOS where projects, um, the placements are registered if they're going on, a, um, I guess, an exchange-type program. And there's that extra layer there where they do a pre-departure briefing and then the associate head of schools sign off on placements that are going to be in international environments. So that's more of us at the moment. Um, we're still in, I guess, our delve, really myself being in this role just under two years and my counterpart a year. Um, this is a big piece for us that we're really keen to try and tidy up and, and get a bit more support mechanism around. So we're not quite ready to... Um, provide any more details unfortunately today but it's a little bit if we do get some movement we're more than happy to share what we're doing and hopefully it's seen as a positive anyone else so um from jcu side in regards to supporting um our students with their placements as well some of the free work that's been done um within our divisions around um inductions for the students as as part of them you know um, taking on board a placement, so signing up to the course, one of those, those things could be a placement, you know, and providing them with that information generically around placements, but then looking to build on that to provide them with extra information about some of the hazards that or risks that they could be exposed to. So if they're going to farms, they may never have been in that environment before, so providing them with information around chemicals or, you know, working with animals or, or, or those sorts of uh, extra information. The other thing that I mentioned earlier to assist the student side to be ready for safety when they go on these placements is providing them with that undergraduate risk management training as well. So looking at um, providing them with uh, generic information in the first year based on what they're going to be exposed to, but based on the industry they might be exposed to as well and then building on that for their second year, third year, fourth year, as their hazards and risks in their environments change for whatever reason as well. So um, a lot of those, those handbooks and those inductions and that conversation that's happening with students um, before they even get to that and making them aware of their responsibilities, I guess, but giving them the opportunity to provide feedback um, with any concerns that they might have in regards to safety to the areas in which they're going. Yeah, one other one we've got, I forgot to add, is um, internally developed more from an academic perspective for the clinical psychology degree, but they have made it multidisciplinary with a little bit of funding is what's called risk aware. And it's a pre-placement module um, for students to undertake before entering clinical environments. And the modules are quite tailored to being, you know, general principles of placement to hygiene, but also specific environments and then provide 
having a case study of what you may well experience on a placement, you know, in terms of a psychology placement, it might be dealing with someone that's got suicidal thoughts um, and that person may well, um, you know, commit suicide and what what do you need to be ready to deal with from a triage process post your interactions with that person if it does happen at some stage after you've been placed with them. So that's one of the um, pieces we are strongly encouraging all of our schools within the faculty to to move across and I think we've got most there. It's been really positively received and I know Deakin's not the only university that um, worked on this project. I think it might have been Griffith as well and there's a couple of others but I'll send the link out um, at the end of the, with the resources we get from today around that for people to have a look at as well. You can register a demo account. I think I'll, I'll work the person up here that you might see a little bit of traffic from that because it is a really um, well-encompassed program that helps provide the students with some guidance before going into a, a placement but also while they're on placement. So for us we um, you know one of the things we've tried to do is uh, bring student services on board um, in you know um, as should something go wrong while the students are out in their placements um, there's a, a mechanism in which um, student services feeds in We've also got um, counselling um, uh, counseling service involved, and this is more for um, students encountering harassment while out on their placements, and making them aware that once they come back, there are support. There is a support net network in place in the form of our um, counselling service to um, help them through their or ordeal. Um, but again, it's always about providing that baseline education prior to them even going out into the field because sometimes when you're out there you quite easily forget the training that you've been given because um, you're in that situation and you, you forget what you're meant to be doing so trying to reinforce that level of training um, through notes through different uh, workshops um, I found it's quite important and just to embed that information to the students to know, yep, you are supported and this is how you can access that level of support for your well-being. So, Brendan, we've got some questions from um, the audience just in regards to uh, what you were talking about with your inductions risk-aware sessions. Yeah. Um, are they delivered online or face-to-face? -face? So, from our side at JCU, they would be offered both. Um, where they can be online, short, sharp and quick, but building on those modules. Um, how does your training work, Brendan? So, so the risk-aware module is wholly online. I think it might be something that's about, I've admittedly not worked my way through all of it because it's very comprehensive and it's quite niche. I'm, I know the psychology module, I think it takes you two or three hours and it's a prerequisite um, before being sort of granted permission to go on a placement. So not being a psychologist, I haven't... Um, or a psychologist in training, I haven't worked my way through it. Um, but also there's other requirements within the pre-placement sites. Some of it would be um, they do days or a half-day session, depending on the degree stream here, where they would come in and go through an array of the areas that they need to be sort of in clinical, I guess, in preparation for clinical placements that the unit teams go through on top of that. And then there's also the, you know, the cloud-based resources ensuring safe for nursing and even med that they've got their relevant vaccinations um, up to date. Um, everyone runs a little bit differently here from the Dove we've done to date. Nursing do it quite well where they have the mandatory requirements such as vaccinations and, um, say, working with children's check if they need that. And then they've got their little bespoke um hospital niche requirements that are outlined within a, a, a unit site that they anything else they need in addition to that they have to upload and be ticked off to commence so we're um as we know there's a lot of silos within the universities and our, our faculty of five schools they all operate a little bit differently and part of our delve we, we are hoping at the end of it we can try and showcase what's been done well so we can try and pull into a bit more of a uniform framework. I don't think we'll fully get there because there are those niche needs, but um, it would be great to showcase at least what people are doing well and see some adoption because there's some really good stuff being done. We just, other areas haven't thought about that yet. So I know I've gone a little bit off tangent, but in short, it's a blend. Yep. 
Um, hello. I'm Raylene. It's, I don't know whether this is working. It's yes, Tracy. Yes. Yeah, Tracy, we can hear you. Um, okay. Um, can I, sorry, I'm just from home. Um, could I just add, um, so my experience is with the health placements and I've just inherited vet placements. So, Vanessa, I'd really like to get in contact with you because our problems are very, very similar. Yep, absolutely. Um, um, and I've just, you know, the vet placements <coughs> where you're saying there's three placements, are you including extra, is that your extramural placements that you're including in that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So our students, you know, if when they start in year one, so they've got two years to do 12 weeks and that 12 weeks can add, be either in terms of six times two or four times three. Mm -hmm. So, and that's just in the years one to three group. And then our year fours, so um, are, are also 12 weeks, but they're separate placements of four times three or six times two again. So, and there, that's, you know, that's per individual student. And mm -hmm. um, so I guess what I, I think um, the most reason, one of the most reasonable ways is to try and build resilience with our students and educate our students, which is where Raylene was talking about uh, the module that's coming and the undergraduate module. And, um, and then we do inductions and things like that, because one of the problems I've worked with health students, medical and nursing and all the health degrees and, and now with vet and the students, you find out the problems afterwards and, you know, um, and that's a really big concern because the students have spent, you know, they, it's trying to get to educate them that, that they need to ring or leave the place right there and then when something happens that is untowards and is, or is, you know, is unsafe. And, um, and I think that's one of, the problems I'm finding in that you, because they've spent money, because they're a long way from home, because they have to do it and they might have to start again and all these other reasons that come into their own personal um, reasoning, it makes it, um, you know, trying to get that message across. And I think we're, you know, I'm, I'm looking at trying to expand our, education to the student to get them to really you know it, it's okay to stop and it's okay to ring in at that point in time that things are tough or things have gone wrong because it's often after the fact that we um, find after you know some of the horrific stories that have happened or the um, yeah, or the behaviours of other others, which I don't believe that we can control um, fully to eliminate any risk. Or and um, so I think our best avenue is towards the student. And um, so I don't know whether that makes sense. Um, yeah, and try and get them to feel empowered that they can, you know. Help, we, and that the university has, the, you know, has their back and has their, you know, their duty of care ready to support them. Because we all have, I think all the universities would have, you know, all the resources in terms of counselling, um, whether you call in or go on campus and make appointments and things like that. And I think we all do that. And, you know, we all run inductions pre um placement inductions um, both for domestic placements and international placements and we also um, with our vet placements you know we make sure so our problem there with vet placements is that they're all self-sourced so all those placements could be a indiv new individual placement every time a student you know finds one and puts an application in for to have it approved so we've started a process where all our farms are, are being put in and when the student um, um, puts in an application with a farm and it's new, we go through an approval process. We haven't yet started the checklist that Raylene was talking about, but we have a small briefer one and, you know, we struggle just to get that in. 
and you've got the student, you know, sitting in the background trying to get their placement approved and getting a bit anxious. And it's, it's because the placement is the university and the student's priority, not the host priority. And it just makes it all very difficult. And then you've got the volume on top of everything. So I really would like, you know, to talk about what is, what would be, you know, acceptable um, practice or best practice around this. And uh, Tracy, you know, I, I, I hear you there because that's exactly the issue that we're having because um, the students are quite afraid of calling in if something goes wrong because, you know, they've got a set number of hours that they need to make up. Yes. And, um, you know, they don't want to be pulled from their placement because, you know, what, what are the consequences? What, what's the fallback? Um, and yeah. for us, it really is about trying to educate them and say, you know, our main concern is your safety. Mm. And we'll work with you in terms of getting back those hours and, and how we can, you know, figure that aspect out. But the first concern is your safety. And, and you're right, you know, if something goes wrong, we want them to be able to pick up the phone or yes. know, call and say something's gone wrong and we need to be able to pull them out immediately instead of waiting for them to come back two weeks later and then find out. And, and it's, two, it's two weeks too late, really. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, so we, we have the same issues and because students are placing, you know, that the importance on trying to get those hours up, Mm. And they're putting that above their safety and we need to really step up our education process here and empower them to know that if they don't feel safe in a situation, they yeah. need to be able to call us and we should be able to, when we must be able to get them out of that situation. And then, you know, take steps later on to um, basically, like I said, um, put an alert next to that farm yeah, we're not sending our students there, or we're working through the issues in terms of what's gone wrong, and um, and like I said, what one student may deem as harassment, another student may find quite acceptable. That's um, right. Yeah, it's yeah. Based on you know our cultural background as well, so we're trying to navigate through that field, um, and it's it's quite tricky for us. So yes, I, I look forward to chatting with you. And, and working together to see what we can do. Excellent. Thank you. Not a problem. I'm, I'm wary we're close to one o'clock. Um, we've probably got time for a couple more questions if they're there, Raylene. There was just one one previous, Brendan, just and, and probably following on what Vanessa and Tracy were talking about um, with approval process. But just um, if there, you know, if there has been no prior student to that farm or that host. Uh, how does the approval process change or what might that look like when you don't, you can't rely on previous um, feedback or experience of other students? Sorry, yeah, I'm not one to so, answer on that. <laughs> with, with regard to that, because um, like Tracy said, that we quite often the students, these farms are self-sourced um, and, you know, they'd be, they would be going there for the first time. And so one of the ways we're trying to work around this because we don't obviously don't have the um, prior feedback is embedding these the induction template into the the little booklet that the students need to take with them when they're going out onto the, into their placement so that the students know that this is what they need to be provided with and once they get to the farm and if they're not being given this level of guidance then they can quite easily you know again providing providing them with uh, or empowering them to call back and say, um, farmers not being able to take off any of these safety requirements or prerequisites, what do I do? And, and we can work from there. But it is very hard when it's a new placement to try and figure out what to do. We just had a, um, uh, a practice that, mm -hmm. um, so this week I noticed that, uh, you know, a student Put in for put in an application so we use in face an application for um and so i'm just learning all their processes mm -hmm. and um put in an application and it came up that this was a and it had very clearly no student placements to at this facility and so i we had a discussion in the, in our placement team and so um and 
so we ended up ringing the because we didn't, you know, we're all new staff and um, because there's been a change of hands in this 12 months, uh, last 12 months. And so we just rang the practice and what had happened is what, it, um, so the practice had been sold and, um, and someone, and, 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 a student of ours, a, an alumni student of JCU, had bought this practice. So now we were able to take off that um, comment against this agency. So um, it, you know, it 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 is it, those little things are working. That um, you know, putting approved against an agent in in the system, using the system as best we can, that type of thing. So, um, yeah. So, and we both don't know what happened, um, why, because it's changed. As I said, changes staff. But we rang forward, and it was in. It's a new, more or less, in, you know, new owners and new staffing. So that was just a little scenario that we've had just recently. Yeah, and I think it's really important, you know, especially when you experience high turnover with staff to ensure that your processes are embedded so that there's continuity, um, especially when you're looking in terms of um, rating your farms and the farms that are a bit of a don't go, uh, that we need to be able to pass on this information as staff, um, you know, change. So the other thing we're going to do is after, so we're trying to build up a pool of approved um, farms and industry um, host organisations for vet science. And so, um, and then hopefully put that list out there to students and, you know, whether it's, it'll be by species, I guess, or their requirements and by state, I guess. So there'll be all these little filters. Mm -hmm. But and hopefully build on that to encourage students to maybe ring back those because some students do struggle finding areas to go to so hopefully you know and building on that list and you know encouraging students to use the list when when they can so and hopefully that will you know put down the workload a little bit but that's a long way away but hopefully we'll get there so we, we do that as well Tracy we've got a list of farms you know, yes about 200 farms on that list but what we're trying to do now is to rate the farms. You know, there's notes, case notes against each of the farms and students have access to these, um, to the list. Yes. Yep. There, or they can self-source. But we need to make it evidently clear the farms that are no-go so that students know and the students are aware of why we would prefer them not to go there. So, yeah, they, they do have access to a list that we've, um, we've been put with, well, the placement coordinator has put together. Excellent. Okay. Um, excellent. Thank you for that, Tracy. Um, I think, yeah, due to your time and that, but I can definitely make sure you get Vanessa's details, Tracy, so um, you can continue those conversations as well. Thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for, I guess, listening in and providing some input. Um, thanks to those that have question, provided questions and commentary around it today. Um, there will be, in closing, there'll be a feedback survey that will come out through ALSA um, shortly. There are also, today's record, this has been recorded. So if you do want to listen back or refer it on to one of your colleagues that's working in this space and has missed today, it will be made available. Um, sharing of resources. If you've got anything that you feel is a value add to others to help benchmark against this or bring it together, please do send it through or put it in the chat box, um, I guess now, but also feel free to send it through to, to one of us and we can collate it in the kit. It'd be ideal to have that by the end of the week, obviously. And then the, the future steps are, I guess, if you've got an appetite for this, please do let it be known in the, in the feedback. Um, if you've got a topic that is of particular interest, that would be handy as well because that can then shape that if there are, I guess, future webinars of this piece that uh, you may get tapped on the shoulder or you can co facilitate like we have today. Um, I know, thank you again to Raylan and Vanessa in particular. It's been thoroughly enjoyable um, in the lead up, even just talking about what we've wanted to do and, and what we wanted to get out of it. And I think it's safe to say, excuse the pun there, that we have been able to get um, some good healthy conversation and some very much some food for thought around 
reviewing what we currently do and if we can make it better. So um, I guess in signing off, thanks to everyone for coming today and we we'll look forward to, the, I guess, hopefully the next one at some stage soon. Brendan, can I just say also a huge thank you to you for actually leading, for initiating this? Um, you know, we, we always have to start somewhere and, and I appreciate the fact that you took the lead and wanted to start this conversation. So thank you to you as well. I blush. <laughs> All right, well, on that note, we'll leave it there. But yeah, once again, thank you everyone. And hopefully we get to um, hear from others soon around other um, relevant topics within the tertiary education sector. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.